How do you do it? Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week. Scott, how are you this morning? Doing well. How are you, Joe? I'm good. I'm good. Norman, we're very happy to have Professor Dr. Norman Marco <laughs> this morning. Norman, yeah. how are you? Okay, Joe. Happy to have you in, and Scott, too. Great. We have each other. That's, uh, yes. that's the way the Reds do it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. We are, uh, that's the way we roll, as we said back in. Uh, yeah, we are. Yes, <laughs> um, yes, yes. We uh, have a, a good, interesting program for you. Well, we will see how good it is. It's at least interesting for me. Scott, uh, it's been a hell of a week. Um, the economy looks like it's about to tank, unfortunately, for the working class. Um, industrial production is down for the first time in a decade. Uh, and Trump is really worried and has gotten extremely er erratic, uh, uh, more than usual, some people yeah. say. And, um, of course, uh, and, and, and one of the signs of the uh, concern that the ruling class has is that there was a special uh, double issue of Time magazine featuring the problems faced by workers who uh, uh, labor for tips uh, I think it's millions of people who are in this category. Tell us a little bit about it. So, um, yeah, cover story in Time Magazine about the, the conditions of uh, tipped workers in the service industry. Um, so little bringing out really the, the tipped minimum wage, federal tipped minimum wage is $2.13 an hour. Oh, my God. Uh, anything other than that has to be made up with tips. And there's a law, of course, that says that, you know, uh, that the, the amount of tips has to reach up to minimum wage or or employers have to make up the difference but it's not you know i think in practice it, it often doesn't it often doesn't happen these are these workers face horrible conditions um and it's a workforce that is two-thirds women um uh, a workforce where uh, african americans and other people of color are, are disproportionately uh represented um it's a a workforce that's a growing part of the economy and will continue to grow for the, you know, the foreseeable future. So this is, it was a great article. It's really worth reading. And what's interesting is that time, you know, doesn't have a, a, a reputation as, you know, the voice of the working class, right? It's a, Not um, <laughs> but it's a sign, I think, of, of how inescapable the class question is becoming, right? It's, it's, there's a, a mass uh, realization, you called it a socialist moment, Joe, um, this yeah. mass realization that the conditions faced by workers in the United States and around the world are, are dangerous, degrading, uh, and, and unsustainable, and that something has to be done. And even, even the top of the ruling class recognizes this. Well, speaking of which, Norman, I, I read an article last week that uh, following the lead of Jamie Dime, uh, Jamie, whatever his name is, the, the CEO of Chase. Um, yeah. They're saying that their interest is no longer uh, uh, determined by increasing shareholder value, which we translate as making maximum corporate profits, but they have to be concerned about uh, more humanitarian issues of the environment and, and uh, women's rights and and uh, child welfare and all of these kinds of things. All of a sudden, they're, they're turning a new leaf. What's going on, Norman? Well, well, well Joe, uh, I wouldn't necessarily believe any of that. First, uh, it reminds me a little bit of what Herbert Hoover said in the 1920s when he talked about service capitalism. Capitalism was becoming humane and would help everybody through private charity and all kinds of programs, and everybody would own stocks and bonds, and that was before the Great Depression. After the Great Depression, uh, what Hoover did was nothing uh, once it began. And uh, frankly, uh, I don't see the capitalist class being able to move in a progressive direction uh, and uh, oppose what Trump is doing, in large part because he's given them so much and continues to give them more and more and more. Uh, if you look at the last 40 years, 
you see uh, that the stock market has gone from about less than 2000 to 25000 Compare that with the way workers' wages and living standards have gone. Well, uh, they stagnated and declined. Uh, who is, who is uh, following who? Now, I always thought that he who pays the piper caused the tune. So is the ruling class following Trump or is Trump following the ruling class, Scott? I, mean, uh, I think I'm going to defer to Norman on this one because I think he's got a really great take on it. Okay, back to you, Norman. Yeah, well, uh, you know, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, you create the monster, and then what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, meaning that uh, Trump is a product of a long period of capitalist concentration, also capitalist decay in terms of political economy, real decay. Uh, and uh, now they have Trump. Uh, he's giving them a great deal. But he's also threatening, uh, in many ways, uh, what they have. So what are they going to do? What are they going to do? By themselves, I would, I would think that they'll do nothing, because that is what they have done over and over again in the past. Uh, if they are going to be saved as a class, uh, they will be saved by people's movements, uh, if they are to, if there is not to be a great crisis. So wait a uh, minute, Norman. Didn't I read in, in about a year ago where there was an article in the New York Times, the op-ed section by a secret dude, a woman in the Trump administration who said, we are the resistance too. And, and, and I'm not gonna let you off that easily. Now, isn't it also the case that no matter what these guys say and women, but it's mainly guys who are in this corporate- you Yeah. Know, uh, cultural yeah. infrastructure. Um, it doesn't matter what their intentions are. Doesn't the drive for maximum profits kind of force them, Scott, to operate in a certain way? Yes, overall, um, uh, they have a. Although there, you know, there, there are the two sort of competing needs or tendencies of of, of the capitalist class as a whole. On the one hand. If you, even if you look at the way they, they describe their vision of the world, they want stability. Um, they want uh, predictable sources of, of revenue and, and profit. On the other hand, they fetishize disruption and and, and that's those are those things aren't oh. just a disagreement. It, they're they're the two sort of necessary parts of capitalist expansion, and that that translates into uh, tensions, you know, within the within the capitalist class. So yes, they, they follow the profits, they pursue profits, but um, uh, firms uh, do it differently, different sectors have different approaches. So it's not, it's not homogenous. I see. So Norman, um, we uh, have seen that uh, President Trump uh, in response to all of these uh, issues, uh, the instability in the economy, and the instability in his presidency, because I read this morning that only according to an AP poll, 32% of the American public are, approve of his uh, administration. That's a, that's a record. Well, it's not a record low, but it's, it's uh. close to it. Um, and he was waxing a little hysterical the other day in front of the White House lawn. His helicopter was, you know, wearing, wearing, wearing. Uh, he was going around talking about he's the chosen one and he's King David and um, he's doing m m miraculous things. And then he went on to say, with respect to Israel, that American Jews are disloyal uh, and, um, and, and, and uh, to Israel. And now they said that Ilhan Omar representative from Minnesota said something similar and they jumped all, jumped all over her, calling her an anti-Semite. But ain't nobody said in the GOP nothing about Trump. What's going on here, Norman? Uh, what's going on here? What's going on here, Joe, is on one level, what I tell my students is the politics of crazy. 
namely the politics of uh, making one wild charge and one wild comment after another disconnected from reality so that uh, people are either running around responding to the wild comments or they sort of turn off and shut off, shut down. Uh, specifically, uh, there is a double standard in mass media, and we must remember that mass media is to put it mildly, not only an instrument of the capitalist class, but traditionally it's been among uh, the the major developed countries, among the most conservative, uh, and they would be supporting Trump if he weren't spending his time calling them every name in the book and acting crazy and threatening them, which he does. Uh, In any case, uh, we see this double standard here. We've seen it over and over again involving Jews, uh, when uh, all kinds of politicians... Richard Nixon, et cetera, et cetera, made all kinds of really crude anti-Semitic statements uh, and comments which were exposed. Very little was said when Jesse Jackson, a progressive candidate, referred to New York in, as Jaime Town, and he apologized. Then everybody went crazy. Uh, the media went crazy. Uh, and we've seen it over and over and over again, which is to divide minority groups, make minority groups fight with each other. And in this case, take a congresswoman who is Muslim, who comes from Palestine, the family, and make her into, quote, the anti-Semite, and uh, simply say absolutely nothing about uh, the people who are cheering Trump on and uh, at the same time uh, waving, uh, trying to turn the American flag into a swastika. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. We can go on and on with that. Tell us a little so, bit about, Norman, this history of uh, Jewish disloyalty and anti-Semitic tropes. I myself yeah. was, until this issue with Ilhan Omar uh, arose, unfamiliar with that, uh, with this issue of loyalty, dual loyalty, the accusation. Could you help us understand that a little bit? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it's a long, long, long history uh, in which, uh, as the crisis in the 19th century of industrial capitalism developed, uh, spokesmen for old aristocracies, for the most reactionary sectors of the capitalist class, began to focus on Jewish minorities, blaming them for both all the evils of capitalism and the threat of socialist revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, that continued until, of course, a government, the Hitler government, uh, which was based on that, Mm -hmm. came to power and it launched uh, not only unprecedented persecutions of Jewish people, resulting in the murder of one third of the Jewish people of the whole world, but also the greatest war in human history and uh, the mass murder of tens of millions of people mm. through the world. So you're saying the world. It, it, it was partially in response to the uh, growth and strength of the Jewish left that this dual, dual loyalty issue came, 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 came up? No, not necessarily of the Jewish left, but mm. that the fact that Jewish people as an oppressed minority, mm. like African-American people in this country and other minority peoples in other countries, uh, were prominent in revolutionary movements, in left movements, and they could be targeted and separated and then blamed, so and then blamed. Divide, this has happened to the world. It, it arose as a divide and conquer strategy. Yes, yes. yeah, 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 exactly. And it's been and it's been well honed, and it's been used for at least 150 years in terms of print media and the development of modern media. And therefore, it must be vigorously re- rejected. Scott? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, well, both Joe and Norman. Um, I was reading recently, I, I forget who wrote the article, about the idea of a, um, a, an anti-Sem- uh, anti-Semitic Zionism um, among, the, the, among evangelical conservatives. Like this, this idea of a, a Zionism, a, a demand for um, like a, the, the a Jewish homeland in Israel uh, that was, had nothing to do with the rights of the Jewish people or, or anything, but was focused on the, 
the needs of, of the Christian right. Is that, um, is that, a, is that at play here? Or is that a, a real historical phenomenon or? Yeah, it is a new, relatively new historical phenomenon in which individuals like Jerry Falwell and others in the past came to identify and support uncritically the right wing government of Israel, which the majority of Jewish people in the United States, while they don't oppose Israel as a country, the majority, the great majority of Jewish people do not support Netanyahu's uh, policies, the policies of the right wing uh, ruling parties in Israel. Uh, So-called Christian Zionism is based on the second coming, the end times, uh, that uncritical support for Israel will lead to Armageddon, the end times, the conversion of the Jews, and uh, the so, destruction um, of the world. Yeah, that, the uh, idea that yeah. the Jews have to be, you know, recuperated, brought into the, the yes, yeah, yeah, the exactly. They have all Jews should return to Israel in preparation for the end times. Trump's recent lunatic statements may suggest to some of the so-called Christian Zionists that the second coming is coming, and he is the second coming. He is the second coming, uh, and uh, he well, will be. I was expecting yeah. more. I was expecting yeah. a little better. The yeah. chosen one. He is the chosen one. This is, think, but this is the politics of crazy. Okay. Heaven help us. I think we need to return a little bit to Earth and to the territory of the United <laughs> States. We've had an interesting uh, the discussion uh, this morning. I think the point here, Norman and, and Scott, yeah. is that we need to reject all forms of, uh, of, of anti-Semitism, all yeah. forms of racism, all forms yeah. of anti-Muslim bigotry, all forms yeah. of homophobia and sexism. We need to yeah. build the unity of all the people against these right-wing Christian uh, uh, conservatives uh, or whatever religious you know, yeah. faith that they have. Most of them are faithless, by the way, in my opinion. They believe yeah. in power. Yeah, they believe in yeah. power and profits, and, and that's, yeah. uh, that's about it. Well, yeah. we'll be coming. Uh, we want to thank you, Norman, for your insights uh, this morning, and uh, we will be back next week with a new edition of This Week at the uh, Communist Party, and it will be one week before our 100th birthday, Norman. And uh, yeah. we're going to have a, a, a big a celebration on the 14th. We want everybody to, uh, to Norman will be speaking, by the way. Yeah, I'll be there. In New York. And uh, I'll be doing something. Uh, we'll see. And um, everybody's invited back to check us out. So uh, thank you, both of you, very much for your patience and your contributions uh, this morning. And... Uh, See you next week. See you next week. Hey, Alan, goodbye, Joe. Great to participate. Wonderful show. Glad to have okay. you. We will definitely invite you back. Okay, Joe. Bye-bye.